On this exciting episode, your youngest brother's a bad seed, your boss is a psychiatrist who can't psychoanalyze himself, and before you know it, you're in a blackmail plot featuring an airplane baron. It's just a typical day in Perry's Los Angeles. It's season two, episode 22 of Perry Mason, The Case of the Bedeviled Doctor. Welcome to the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy, and my purpose here is pretty simple. Provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. I plan to do a pod for every episode of the television series, and as time permits, I'll look at some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each episode, I'll give a brief refresher on the plot, and if the episode was based on a novel, I'll compare the book with its television adaptation. Next, I'll list some key pieces of trivia, as well as tackle the episode's main theme. We'll feature a Perry proverb, a moment of wisdom from the man himself, and then we'll finish with a post-case water cooler, where just like Perry, Della, and Paul... We can rehash the ins and outs of their adventures. But first, to the law library! Each episode in the law library, we return to prior cases to refresh our memories about Perry's past so we can find fresh precedents for future cases. In this episode, Barbara Haywood pipes up in court and gets held in contempt. He's lying, Governor. He was out all night. He was out with some little tramp. You will be quiet, madam. If the court please, this is Mrs. Haywood. That's no explanation for her conduct. I hereby sentence you to five days in jail for contempt of court. As you know, that's the least of Haywood's worries by the end of the episode, but still, this seems like a hair-trigger decision by the judge. I mean... Where was the judge in the case of the lost last act as John Gifford held a gun on the court? Is that guy going to get off without being in contempt? I mean, he and his wife are kissing while he's still on the stand by the time it's all said and done. Now, I don't want to see Gifford spend a night behind bars. I just want to see a little judicial calibration. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe we've had a contempt of court charge in the show yet, which prompts this question. What's your favorite in-court expostulation that merited at least a contempt of court warning? Mine comes in the case of the Vagabond Vixen, where movie executive John Addison gives key testimony from the defendant's chair. Is this his license number? KYL907? If it's the last one, it is. KYL 907, that's the number of the studio car Edgar Farrell was driving. You were with Edgar Farrell, were you not? The judge, silent as the grave, as Perry proceeds to grill Veronica Dale like a steak. I guess Addison's Hollywood credentials let him rewrite law into a more compelling narrative. Let Perry figure out how to get that evidence out of his witnesses the good old-fashioned way, Judge. He doesn't need any help. Let a thousand contempt of course charges bloom. Now, let's get to the plot of this episode. The Case of the Bedeviled Doctor Edith Douglas comes home to find her ne'er-do-well brother. And boy, has he got a story to tell. They're looking for you. A couple of boys from Vegas. You've been gambling again. I'm no good, Edith. I, I don't know why you waste your time with me. Edith doesn't suspect anything is up, even when Mark has an answer to his money and mob problems in the flare of a nostril. Just get him a key to the safe in the psychiatrist office that Edith works in. You know, so Mark can steal a highly sensitive recording of an industry bigwig confessing to an affair. It's just that easy, sis. And boy, does Mark pour on the p 
pathos rather thickly. Well, when they fish my body out of the ocean, don't bother to identify it. Well, next thing we know, the airline bigwig, one Peter Haywood, is bearing his soul to Dr. David Craig. But I'm to blame for looking elsewhere. Remember, I, I told you about this other woman. Craig, a psychiatrist and the titular bedeviled doctor, offers bromides about self-help and neurosis. I can't give it the answer. My job is to help you find it yourself. <laughs> Next thing you know, Mark has broken in and stolen the tape, and Dr. Craig has to make an office call on Perry. Now, Perry reminds his old friend that he's not legally responsible. But once Paul Drake shows the good doctor that his nurse must be involved, Dr. Craig shows that the emotional stakes of the case are high, leading Della and Perry to psychoanalyze the psychoanalyst. You know, Perry, for an analyst, I'd say he seems emotionally disturbed. He is. I'd say he was in love with his nurse. Craig confronts Mark, but the narrow-shouldered, nostril-flaring rogue pulls the rug out from under the lovelorn Craig. Douglas has made copies, and he peddles one to Mrs. Haywood and Mr. Haywood. Oh, boy. You can have it if you want to, Mr. Haywood. I got another copy. You don't let me go. It'll cost you a lot more. When Mark ends up dead, Dr. Craig's the obvious suspect. Here's his motive. Mark had a tape of Mr. Haywood telling all about himself and someday. Where did he get it? He stole it from Dr. Craig's office. His sister got him a copy of the key. Well, I guess now we know Dr. Craig's motive. But Perry knows there are a few other suspects. Your doctor pal took out a license for a 38 seven months ago. Mm, that doesn't prove anything. Granted, but he had a motive. So did at least three others. Mr. Peter Haywood, his girlfriend Dana, and Edith Douglas. Perry's got his own suspicions. He cooks up a recipe to catch a killer outside the courtroom and involve the police. You start with a phone call from a woman devoted to the defendant. I was going through my brother's things and I found something and... Well, I'd like to talk to Mr. Haywood. Well, he isn't here. Can you tell me where I can reach him? You add a house call by Perry's suspect. What are you doing here? You phoned my home several hours ago. You wanted to find out where my husband was. Have you been able to reach him? Put in a generous dash of self-incrimination. I've searched the apartment and I found it. I searched the place myself and it wasn't here. Oh, it was here. It was hidden behind that mirror. And serve with a generous helping of Trag. When ballistics gets hold of this, it'll do enough talking for everybody concerned. Complete the deal by convincing the devotee of your defendant that, you know, he still digs her. Edith, don't you think he understands? You had to make a choice. Either betray the man you loved or see your brother be killed by mobsters. Delish. As you can see, Barbara Haywood probably won't have to worry about the contempt of court charge. In the denouement, Della and Perry share in some ironic commentary about bosses and secretaries. Edith, don't you think he understands? You had to make a choice. Either betray the man you loved or see your brother be killed by mobsters. Those two? Now, let's get trivial, shall we? Each episode in the trivia section, I give you three takeaways. A Paul is a subject worth investigating more. Adela is something about a particular actor or actress in the episode. And a Perry, well, something we learn about our intrepid hero. Our Paul for this episode involves the apparent bounty of Smith & Wesson revolvers available in the United States circa 1960. You'll remember that our bedeviled doctor complicates his defense when he ditches a Smith & Wesson in the ocean. When the absence of the murder weapon comes up in court, Perry jumps on the ubiquity of this particular weapon. <laughs> 
So this episode's poll prompt, is the Smith & Wesson a thing of the past? How many of these handguns are there in the United States today? Should someone go diving for Dr. Craig's sunken pistol in the hopes of finding a treasure awaiting its recovery and sale? Our Della this episode concerns Philip Terry, the neurotic and brilliant Peter Haywood. If you've seen the movie The Leech Woman from 1960, I've seen it thanks to Mystery Science Theater 3000, you'll know that Philip Terry was apparently a go-to casting choice in 1960 as a professional who has a lush for a wife. Well, that's a novelty. You're refusing anything with alcohol in it. <laughs> wow. I'm used to seeing you sober this time of day. Whew. You're trying to humiliate me. You did that years ago. Old P.T.'s most famous for having married Joan Crawford in 1942, her third marriage. More about that in a moment. Terry was born in 1909 in San Francisco. He eventually attended Stanford University, where he played football and got involved with theater. After a brief stay in New York, he goes to London, and he was enrolled at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. After some time in Britain, he goes back to Hollywood. He takes a job with CBS Radio, and he starts performing in a number of on-air plays, his specialty, Shakespeare. In 1937, an MGM talent scout hears him in one of these broadcasts, arranges an interview. Terry makes a screen test, and he got a contract with the studio. After moving from MGM to Paramount, Terry ended up at RKO in the 40s. He was in The Lost Weekend, another film about alcoholism starring Ray Milland and To Each His Own, 1946, starring Olivia de Havilland. Apparently, outside his Hollywood career, he was a real estate mogul, a good salesman and investor. He became wealthy not from his acting career, but from his real estate investments. In 1942, he married film star Joan Crawford. The marriage only lasted till 1946. A hilarious note, you can probably find out more about Terry in biographies of Joan Crawford than you can in biographical notes about Terry himself. Apparently, Terry had a face that would have looked better in glasses and... To make matters more complicated, he needed glasses to see well, but he rarely, if ever, wore glasses because that's not what leading men do. Now, the biographical note I want to give you here comes from the 1977 memoir Mommy Dearest by Christine Crawford. That was Joan's daughter from a previous marriage. The following anecdote illustrates what Crawford did to people she no longer loved. So one night late in the marriage, Terry and Crawford are fighting about whose movie they're going to screen. Philip Terry's new movie or Joan Crawford's new movie. And they leave it up to the daughter to decide. And Christine makes the vote for mom's film. Terry was gone very soon, and now I quote from the memoir. After Philip left, an amazing thing happened. Within 24 hours, there was not a trace of him left anywhere in the entire house. His room and bath were stripped of every single personal item. All the pictures of him in my mother's room and the library downstairs were gone. Our baby scrapbooks, where all the photographs of my brother and me were Neatly mounted on page after page, Philip's image was ripped out of every picture in each of our books. Sometimes only his head was ripped off. One or two of the photos were left with just a severed male hand sticking out beyond the torn part. Except for those mutilated photographs, it was as if he had never existed at all. So ominous. So this dude was on the receiving end of a massively neurotic partner. I wouldn't suggest that Joan go see Dr. Craig about her problems, though. The guy was working out some personal history in this Perry episode. 
And he'd do some more. He's going to come back for four more episodes in the television run. In 1973, Terry retired, moved to Santa Barbara, California, and suffered the first of a series of strokes in 1978. He lost his mobility and was an invalid for a couple of years before his death at the age of 83. Our parry for this episode involves the very strange item Perry keeps in his desk. Now, we've joked about how Perry's a better detective than his actual professional investigator, Paul Drake. This episode lends that argument credence. Look at what Perry keeps handy. Well, that's a novelty. You're refusing anything with alcohol in it. <laughs> wow. I'm used to seeing you sober this time of day. Ooh. You're trying to humiliate me. You did that years ago. That's right. He's got a magnifying glass just hanging out in his desk. The game's afoot, Sherlock. Watch out, Paul. Perry's just delegating to you when he needs you to do something. Our intrepid hero probably has a fingerprint kit in his office lavatory. Our theme for this episode is psychiatry. Now, we've seen Doctors of the Mind before on Perry Mason. In the case of the negligent nymph, for instance, or most notably in the case of the deadly double. In that case, the psychiatrist correctly diagnoses Helen Reed's predicament. She has schizophrenia. In this case, however, Dr. Craig seems like an amateur. First, what is it this guy actually does for his clients? I can't give it the answer. My job is to help you find it yourself. <laughs> okay, so he's a glorified facilitator. That's fine, if he's actually facilitating. But just how accurate is his diagnosis of Peter Haywood? Here's what Haywood reports about what Dr. Craig told him. As Dr. Craig once told me, indecision was my big problem. I never could force myself to act when it really counted. Wait a minute. Isn't Haywood the guy who's an airplane magnet? How do he manage to make that decision when it really counted? Then we've got the problem of self-application. Physician of the mind, diagnose thyself. Did you get the tape back? That's what he led me to believe, but apparently I don't know as much about psychology as I thought I did. You know, I thought I knew myself very well. But I was wrong. I never thought it was possible for me to ever kill a human being under any circumstances. A lack of self-awareness doesn't inspire confidence. And then the final nail in the coffin of this guy's confidence, his habit of recording his sessions. You can't just take notes. You want to invite blackmail? So we add all this up. The freshman move of falling in love with your nurse, his lack of self-awareness, his budget methodology. Maybe this doesn't constitute a referendum on psychiatry entire, but it's surely a referendum on this particular psychiatrist, Dr. Craig. Please change occupations. And clients of this guy, I advise you to change doctors pronto. And that prepares us for this episode's Perry Proverb. We catch Dr. Craig in a moment of tenderness. He's in jail. The facts point to his guilt. He, meanwhile, is worried about Edith Douglas. Craig sees Perry's questions as implying that Edith had something to do with the murder. So he comes to her defense. And Perry shuts his mouth. You know, I thought I knew myself very well, but I was wrong. I never thought it was possible for me to ever kill a human being under any circumstances. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this statement applies to every sort of person who ends up as Perry's client. Now, Perry doesn't go theological, but he knows the psychiatrist needs to stop analyzing others if he can't analyze himself. Knowledge begins at home, Dr. Craig. And now, let's take a sip from the water cooler. You know, there is 
one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. The Paul prompt from our last episode involved banking hours. You'll remember that Frank Brooks wanted sketchy playwright and philanderer Ernest Royce to get him his money promptly because it's Friday after all. So we asked, was this a thing? Here's how my dad responded. Quote, regarding the Paul prompt, extended Friday hours were standard in the days before internet banking, ubiquitous ATMs, and the popularity of direct deposit. Employees were paid on Friday. They needed to have the opportunity to get to the bank after work, withdraw cash needed for the coming week, and perhaps make a house or car payment. During the week, banks closed at 3 p.m., drive up at 4 p.m., but on Friday, banks were often open until 6 p.m., drive ups until 7. Today, Friday hours are the same as Monday through Thursday, with closing time being either 5 or 6 p.m. in most cases. Saturday hours are attenuated, with many banks closing at noon, some as late as 3 p.m. Frank Brooks was correct. Ernest Royce had time to get to the bank and withdraw the 75 grand Brooks demanded. That's an awful lot of hamburgers. Thanks for the help, daddy O. As always, I'd love feedback about this particular episode of the podcast in general. Was there something about this episode you'd like to comment on or correct? You can email me at theperrypod at gmail.com and you'll find that link in the show notes. All Perry Pod episodes are available via Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. Thanks again for joining me on this pod journey. Join us next time for a great episode that has a humdinger of a novel as source material. It's the case of the howling dog. Join us, won't you? Until then, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, Keep on walking that Park Avenue beat.